you can find passion in anything. And, and I've learned over the years, what I believe is what separates the most successful people in the world from everybody else. The majority of people is grit. And, you know, grit as defined by Angela Duckworth in her great book, Grit, is, you know, passion plus perseverance towards long-term goals. And I find that real passion comes once you figure out, you know, something you feel you can be, you know, you can be good at and, and you can contribute to a lot of your passion is going to come from the pursuit of getting better at what you're doing and achieving a long-term goals. Welcome to The In Factor, conversations about how great entrepreneurs started, stumbled, and succeeded. I'm Rebecca White, and today's guest is Don Winner. Don is the founder and CEO of DLP Real Estate Capital, a multifaceted company that leads and inspires the building of wealth and prosperity through the execution of innovative real estate solutions. DLP has been ranked in the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies in the U.S. for eight consecutive years and has been named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the top 15 real estate firms in the U.S. for the fifth year straight. He is also the author of the best-selling book, Building an Elite Organization. Don started from poverty and is now a master of scaling high growth, high profit entrepreneurial companies. We're excited to have Don on today, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Don, thank you for joining me today on InFactor. Hey, it's a really, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Sure. So you've got a really impressive bio, and you've accomplished a lot in a really short amount of time. You're a young guy and already had tons of success, you know, growing a huge company. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you developed the skills that you've gotten and where you are today? Absolutely. And, and I appreciate the young comment. I have started recently getting reasonably young instead of young. So uh, <laughs> I'm 36 now and I've been on my entrepreneurial journey, I guess, for 30 years, you, you could say, but which I can kind of explain what I mean by that. But I've been in running my organization now for, for 15 years when I started DLP. For us, it started the really quick kind of backstory to my entrepreneurial career is my father actually told this story at my my wedding, first time I'd ever heard it. And when I was five years old in kindergarten, my father was packing those little packs of Hostess donuts. If you remember those, those little yeah, you know, sure. circular donuts into my lunchbox. And there were six in a, in a pack. And I started selling them to my classmates for 50 cents a piece. And <laughs> so I was making $3 a pack of, of donuts. And did that went on for weeks until the school found out and told my parents and, and they stopped sending me donuts. But that was, you know, kind of first time my, my family members seeing the entrepreneurial spirit and it carried through. I was running, you know, businesses through middle school and through high school, and then actually moved out of my parents' home in high school at 17 and started supporting myself initially through waiting tables at restaurants and put myself through college, got nearly a full ride to Drexel University in, in Philadelphia. But all along, I was doing these, you know, working restaurants and going to college. I, I was determined from the eighth grade that I was going to be a wealth manager, a financial advisor, because in a career day, a, a financial advisor came in and, you know, there were all the, you know, there was a doctor who came in and different careers. And he came in and showed us this chart that financial advisors made more money than doctors, lawyers, accountants, et cetera. And it was entrepreneurial. You were on a boss. And, and I was like, well, I'm good at math. And this, this is for me. So I was set that that's, that's what I was going to do. But when I was waiting tables in college, a gentleman kept coming into the restaurant I worked at called Texas Roadhouse. Probably been there. Yes, I had to line dance. Have you ever been to a Texas Roadhouse? <laughs> and he asked me to come work for him a number of times. And finally, one day I went and sat and talked to him. And he told me that I would make $2,000 a week if I came to work for him. And I was 19 at the time. And $2,000 a week sounded really good. And his, his business was selling alarm systems. He was an ADT security dealership. So didn't really know that what that meant is my job was, you know, you know, knocking, knocking on doors. doors. Yes. Yeah, so knocking on residential doors is what I did. And I think because he gave me that belief that I should make $2,000 a week or told me that's what was expected of me. My first paycheck for two weeks was $5,280. And that turned out to be one of my worst paychecks. Wow. And later in life, I found out because Nathan's still a good friend of mine. I found out later in life that no one had ever even made $1,000 a week for him. So he just kind of pick this number to get me to come work for him. And, but it set this belief that that was possible and that's what was expected. And 
And that's what I did. And so it was going really well. I became the top sales rep in the country for ADT. And this gentleman, Nathan, who owned the dealership was also a real estate agent. And this was 2006, the peak of the real estate market. And he was a real estate agent at Keller Williams Real Estate. And he was making a lot of money selling real estate. And he convinced me that if I got my real estate license, I would do really great. If I could sell alarm systems, I could sell real estate and convinced me to go down this path of getting into, into real estate. So I pretty much gave up sleep for about three weeks, took my classes you know, online, took my test. I was still in college and I was still you know, selling alarm systems full time and got my license and went to a marketing conference the day I got my license and learned the concept of having a unique selling proposition. And yeah. my marketing message was your home sold, guaranteed, or I'll buy it. And considering the month I got my real estate license was October 2006, which was the peak, that month was the peak of the real estate market here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I'm talking to you from right now, actually, that was a great marketing message at the right time because people were struggling to sell their home. And so started helping them sell their home. And then I started stepping in and helping just buy their home if they didn't have time or were in distress and couldn't go through the normal process. So that launched, you know, my investment business and you know, the, that was the beginning of offering solutions to those in, in need and focused around housing that launched and grew into all the business we run to this point, which today, you know, we're about 450 team members, employees, and uh, we do a few hundred million dollars a year of revenue. We've grown by 60 plus percent every year for 15 years now and have built an organization, you know, I'm really, really proud of. What a great story and what a perfect example of everything that is the entrepreneurial mindset and what I call the practice of entrepreneurship. There's so much in there, I think, to talk about. And as you know, we were talking about before the show that a lot of our listeners are students. Yeah. And so, you know, I see a lot of young people that, like you, started out, you know, even in elementary school thinking with an entrepreneurial mindset. In fact, my son was the same way. He made those, I don't know if you remember those little bracelets that you could twist uh -huh. together with? Yeah. He would t talk me into taking him to the craft store to buy all the, the inventory. And then he would take him to school. But what he did was get all the, he, there were a number of girls in his class. This sounds kind of sexist, but number of girls <laughs> in his class that liked making them. So he would buy all the materials, take them to school and get them to make the bracelets. Then he would sell them. <laughs> so, <laughs> there were like some it. interest. I had to have a talk with him about that. But my point in, in all of this is from beginning, you had that entrepreneurial mindset, but the other piece to it is that you're 36, you've already accomplished a lot, but there's a lot of hard work that goes into, you don't sell $5,000 worth security systems in a couple of weeks without a lot of hard work. And I loved also that you brought up goal setting because you know there is a lot of power in that. So there's just so many things to dig into there. Let's talk, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about, before we move on, let's talk a little bit about sales. So sales has been an important part, I guess, of your journey. And would you say to somebody that wants to be an entrepreneur that they need to learn to sell? And, and if so, you know, was taking a selling job a good experience to prepare yes, you? Absolutely. That's a great question. I, I'd say for me, it was definitely a great experience. I think the reality is if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you absolutely are in sales, right? And, and you know, whether your official job has a sales title to it, you're going to need to be in sales. And, you know, we talk to our 450 team members all the time. And of course, by title that we have accountants and we have, you know, underwriters and we have processors and we have lots of different jobs. And, but we're all in sales. What we tell everybody, you know, it's all of our responsibility to offer our services to those in, in need and take care of our customers. And we teach our people in, you know, accounts payable, you know, when you're on the phone with a vendor, you're in sales, right? You know, that vendor is a, is a client of ours. And so we're all in sales and you have to accept that, you know, many people think, oh, I'm not a salesperson or I, you know, it's not my thing or, but if you want to successfully grow a business, you're going to need to accept that understanding that sales is an important part of that. And I think once you once you accept, and this was important to me, is is early on I realized that whatever I've you know been in, involved in selling, that the person I was going to sell a product or a service to would be better off if they had that product or service. And when you deep down genuinely believe that that person is going to be better off working with you and your company than if they didn't, it feels much more natural to offer something when you feel you're genuinely you know helping somebody. That's a, an important part, but. 
I'd say it's very unlikely for entrepreneurs, unless maybe you have a partner or something and your partner is the one who's going to drive the revenue, but it's very few entrepreneurs are able to really grow a successful business without having to roll up their sleeves and sleeves and, and sell, especially you know in, in the beginning. Yeah, I agree with you. And I love what you said about feeling like you're helping people because it's, it's important to be selling something you believe in, right? And something that you do believe is going to provide value because at the end of the day, it's about providing value to somebody else. And so that's, I really like all that. You know, one of the questions that I get from students a lot of times is, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't, people always tell me to follow my passion, but I don't know what that is. And, you know, you thought you knew, but once you got out and started doing something, you kind of found out that, that you didn't have the full picture maybe. And would you say that, I mean, what would you say to somebody who says, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't really know what I'm passionate about? What I'd say is, you know, I think the Steve Jobs per se concept of passion is extremely you know, flawed, right? You know, find something you believe in and you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? And, you know, and, you know, most of us probably as children, you know, the things we'd love to do, right? Like I would have loved to be a professional athlete, like many, you know, kids, right? Right. But I'm five foot 10 at my, on my best day. And, and so being a professional basketball player wasn't really likely in the cards for me, right? But, you know, but in seriousness, you know, that's what people think about. And I think it's certainly important that, you know, you're in an industry that you feel, you know, brings value to kind of what we talked about, about earlier. But I think you can easily find immense passion, you know, in a world such as accounting, right? Accounting is to most would be considered a mundane business, but you can find tremendous passion in the field of accounting, you know, in starting your own business or, or serving a certain client base, You can find passion in anything. And and I've learned over the years, what I believe is what separates the most successful people in the world from everybody else. The majority of people is grit and, you know, grit as defined by Angela Duckworth in her great book, grit is, you know, passion plus perseverance towards long-term goals. And I find that real passion comes once you figure out, you know, something you feel you can be, you know, you can be good at and, and you can contribute to a lot of your passion is going to come from the pursuit of getting better at what you're doing and achieving a long-term goal. So I think, you know, some of the most successful people I know, happiest people I know are in businesses that most of us would consider, you know, very boring, but they became good at it at some point, you know, experienced it, tested it, found, found, somehow ended up in a career or an industry or a company and, you know, got passionate, being really good and, and offering the best product or service or, or value they could they could provide. And that's where I think real real passion comes from. And it can be found in, in the most unlikely places. So I think there's value, you know, in the beginning stages of your career and testing and evaluating different things. And then once you find something that you feel you can you can be good at, enjoy doing, you know, the passion of being becoming great at that is is the key. And and my last and, and a couple another great book on this topic that I love. And actually I have this gentleman just on my podcast, Brad Stolberg, who wrote a great book called Passion Paradox that I highly recommend as, as well to better understand the concept of, of passion. But my last kind of note is I find a lot of entrepreneurs and those who are you know driven and, and really want to start a business, really want to be successful, often confuse, you know, drive and grit and I see a lot of young entrepreneurs who they'll work 100 hours a week, 120 hours a week. You know, they'll go all in around an idea and, and very passionate about that idea. And it's a lot of fun being a part of something new and exciting and developing and, and whiteboarding. And, and that part is all really fun. But what, what you find is at the end of the day, once you get something off the ground and you have customers and now you have to deal with being good at servicing customers and dealing with issues and problems and having to improve and iterate your products and and so forth for a lot of young entrepreneurs that that's not as much fun anymore. And then they go and, you know, go after the greener pastures and find something else that's fun to go chase and exciting and, and they're driven and and hungry, but they don't, they lack the grit to, to fight through and understand that no matter what business you're in, you can be the most exciting, cutting edge, innovative business in the world then day you're going to have to service customers. You're going to solve issues. You're going to be in meetings. You're going to need employees. You're going to have to deal with all these challenges, regardless of what business you're in. That isn't the fun, free, I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want kind of mindset that a lot of entrepreneurs are originally attracted to. Yeah. I, so much, so much powerful in that. I think to think about, 
you know, one of the, I've done a lot of work over the years trying to tease out the competencies of entrepreneurship. And one of them that I've identified, I label as executing past failure, which is not fun for anybody, but it takes that grit and that perseverance and resilience. And I love that you were talking about passion in a different way. I think teasing out that definition and understanding it for each of us is probably part of all of our, it's part of everybody's journey to kind of figure that out because it it can be passionate about, you can be passionate about being excellent at whatever you're doing. Would you also say, and I think I heard you say that it's just important to get out there and try some things. So if you don't know, maybe you, you haven't experienced enough yet. It sounds like, so you've taken all of this, what you've learned over the years, and you've built an amazing company here at at a very young age. And your company, DLP, has, has a number of different dimensions, I guess. So could you talk a little bit about that company a little bit more and how you've grown it? Because there is the You know, there is pursuing your passion and getting something started, but there's the grit of actually building it and bringing on people and scaling and the hard work of transitioning. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs love ideas, but when it comes down to managing and leading, that's hard for them. So could you talk about about your company first? And I know it's a packed question, but your company and then how you've scaled it and what that's been like for you? Yeah, I'd love to. So my company called DLP Capital, we're headquartered in St. Augustine, Florida and have a Northeast headquarter where I'm talking to you from uh, right now in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Today, we're basically 12 different business units that make up the parent company, DLP Capital. So we have a lending division where we lend money to real estate operators, developers, and builders, entrepreneurial real estate businesses in short. We invest directly in building, developing, and improving you know, workforce housing around the the country and then do all the hard work of property management and construction management and asset management. We run private investment funds, which is the center of our universe where high net worth families invest their capital with us. And then we deploy that capital into real estate and into entrepreneurial real estate operators. And then we have a real estate brokerage and a title company and a loan servicing company. So a number of businesses, but all at the end of the day revolves around investing in housing that is affordable and will remain affordable for working families. That's the center of our our universe. And we're focused on making an impact on four really critical crises in America. The first is is that affordable housing crisis where the average cost of housing has gone up 70% rental housing in the past decade, while incomes have gone up four to 6%. And there's a, a traumatic undersupply of housing, which is driving up the rent growth. And that's the first crisis we're really focused on. This, the second one we're focused on making an impact on is what basically we're talking about right now, which is the jobs crisis. And I believe that a lot of the jobs that are going to be automated over the next you know, 10 to 20 years isn't all bad news that people are, a lot of people are afraid of that and the automation that's coming. I think it is going to create a new wave of productivity and opportunity. But the only way you really create new jobs is through small businesses, through entrepreneurs. The governments don't create jobs that we need driven, hungry, entrepreneurial people to start businesses and create new jobs. And so that's the second area we're really focused on. The third is legacy. And the fourth is happiness. And the four crises we're really, really focused on. And the happiness crisis is very much interconnected to the to the jobs crisis, in, in my opinion, which I could certainly get into. But those are things we're focused on. And But I think at the center of you know what we've done is, and how we've gone on our journey, it's been very a very natural journey in that you know I started as a real estate agent And my focus was finding home sellers who needed to sell their home. And so that led to people in different situations, some who needed to go, who needed to sell and were willing to, you know, go through listing their home and showing it and so forth. And that grew my real estate brokerage. Other people couldn't wait because they were in desperation. It seems like a long time ago, but in, you know, 2008, 2009, there was a lot of desperate times and they just needed to sell really quickly. And and so we started just buying their home. And then we had people who were upside down on what they owed on their home and, we were at the forefront of really what became a very big short sale industry of people selling their home and banks taking less than what was owed. That was a brand new concept back then. And we launched a nationwide, you know, short sale division. And then we had some people who couldn't sell their home, couldn't, you know, they got relocated to a new jobs. So they couldn't live there anymore, but they didn't want to ruin their credit by doing a short sale and they owed more than their home was worth. So what did they, could they do? So we started renting their homes out and do, doing property management. And, you know, so everything kind of has developed naturally as we grew our business of buying distressed homes through the downturn, we couldn't find enough good contractors. 
So he said, well, we're going to have to launch a construction arm. And, you know, so everything, you know, has developed, you know, naturally as you know, market cycles have changed and as we've had just new opportunities to solve, you know, the problems that we saw right, right in front of us. And often as we've gone into all these industries I'm in of property management and just real estate in general or lending or, or capital management, I'm about to buy a bank where we're going to close on a bank in a couple of months. You know, these are all, you know, pretty big old industries that are open to a lot of disruption, but it's not always, you know, huge technology disruption. A lot of times it's just a different way of, of thinking and, and approaching issues, not accepting, you know, Adam Grant just released a book called Think Again. And it's a great book on the concept of, you know, not uh, assuming, you know, the way things are and your assumptions on things are, are correct. And, and that's kind of the way we've approached, you know, everything that, that we do. And, and so it's ha- been a natural evolution. And as we've evolved, kind of what's been f- front and center and what's been the biggest focus and, and our biggest kind of engine to what we do has kind of evolved. But I was always willing to, as you said, scale, you know, it's, it's always center of my mind. So when I was a real estate agent, my third month into the business, I realized very quickly that I had to be, if I wasn't making money, if I wasn't in front of clients or getting in front of clients, meaning, you know, prospecting. So a few months into my career, I hired my first assistant and I hired her part-time was how she came aboard. By the end of the first week, I had her working full-time. Three weeks later, I hired a second full-time assistant because she was overwhelmed and then about two months later, I hired the third and two out of those three ladies still worked with, for me to this day. But I had you know, three assistants six months into my career. I was 20 years old. I was still in college at that point and I needed help and, and realized you know, I was willing and not afraid to, to bring people in so that I could do the things where I was you know, most, most valuable. And I've taken that approach you know, throughout growing my business, not afraid to bring people aboard and certainly didn't know everything about management or leadership at that time, but was willing to and still don't but was willing to, to seek, you know, seek knowledge. And I've always been an avid reader and, and would read, read a lot and, and find successful people. I'm in industries like most industries that have been around a long time. And I'd find people been successful and pick their brain and meet with them and do anything I could to get people to, who, who knew what they would, knew were doing or had success in areas to be willing to, to mentor and, and teach me. And so, you know, I've taken that, that kind of mindset. And then about four or five years into my career, I'd read, you know, probably at that point, I'd already read, you know, thousand books on, you know, leadership or management or marketing or sales or, you know, organization or execution or, or whatnot, right? All these different topics and all the greats like Jim Collins and so forth. And, but I re- came across a book about 10 years ago called Traction. And Traction is a great book for not, it's not really a great in terms of starting your first business, but if you already have started a business and starting to have some success to help you deal with that success and deal with, you know, having more people and building a real culture and putting discipline into your business the way I think about it. And so the book is on a system called EOS. And so I read it and I was like, wow, this is the first book that, that kind of brought a lot of these different principles and ideas and so forth together in an organized way. So we implemented that into our organization and it was really powerful more for my team and getting them on the same page than as much for me and them understanding these concepts and bringing it kind of all together. And it was a really great starting point for us of putting organization structure in place. What happened for us though, is we sort of quickly outgrew EOS as it's in what it was. And we had to go find other kind of pieces to the puzzle and we were bolting on other concepts and ideas and developing tools and developing ways to put these ideas into place. And very quickly, we realized we weren't running EOS, the system that that book is on. We were running something different that we had developed. And we call it the elite execution system. And so we started running that and, and formalizing that. And it's all the components of discipline. The center of it is, and this isn't what most entrepreneurs want to hear, but running a successful business is about disciplined thought, disciplined people, and disciplined action. And that discipline is what gives you freedom to do the exciting and fun things. And putting that discipline through our organization has been really, really critical. And it got to the point that we implemented into our organization really well. We started then teaching this system to those that we were lending money to and we were investing in to help them put discipline in their business and help them grow and help reduce the risk of us investing money with people. And it got to the point that I wrote a book on the topic recently called Building an Elite Organization and now really taking these concepts of helping organizations who've already you know, had some success. The market's already determined you have a product or a service that people want, but how do you scale it? How do you duplicate yourself? How do you grow consistently, you know, year over year? Yeah. Wow. So much in there too, that I want to talk about. So you brought up your book. I'm glad you did building an elite organization. And I'm really excited to hear that that 
transpired out of your own learning along the way, kind of taking bits and pieces of what you were learning and putting that together. One of the things that struck me as I was listening to you talk is the way you scaled, which was, you know, what we were originally talking about. And the scaling, you know, a lot of people, this is when a lot of businesses fail, as you pointed out. It's very difficult to go from being an entrepreneurially run organization to an administrative managed organization, which is what happens when you bring on a lot more people. But your evolutionary approach really came from your willingness to seek out opportunities, right? And your ability to recognize them and your willingness to pursue them. So each time, so it was like taking steps, right? As opposed to this big bite, I guess. So from a scaling perspective, I think that makes a lot of sense. When, when you're talking about building an elite organization, does it also work that way? Is it, is it about taking logical steps, but keeping your eye on opportunities and learning along the way, which is what I heard you talking about? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And, and you're, you're, you're dead on. So the way I think about it is every organization has, even an organization of one person, has four quadrants as, as we think about it, which are strategy, people, operations, and then we call acceleration, which is sales and marketing together. And so the four different components of running a business. And I think what, what a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, and if you do what I did early on, and you're, you know, and I'm guessing for those listening to this podcast, right, is you're out there seeking information and you're listening to podcasts and reading books and you know, looking for, you know, expertise and you talk to one expert or guru, read one book and they tell you the key to growing your business is content marketing or it's leadership or it's management or it's, you know, it's hiring the right people. You know, there's all these different ideas out there, all these different concepts and in and of themselves, most of, you know, the books you'll probably read are probably correct and accurate and have great insights and perspectives. The problem though is, If you put all your focus on one of these areas at at a time, you're going to end up with an off-balance business, right? If I had all the leads and opportunities and and potential customers that wanted my product, but I operationally couldn't, you know, fulfill their their needs, that's not a a good situation. If I built the best processes and SOPs and best organization in the world, but I didn't have any clients who wanted my products, again, isn't, isn't going to work, right? So so you need a plan, we call it the compass, you need a a plan that incorporates all of these quadrants together and a part of one plan to help you incrementally grow. And, and, you know, we've grown by most people's standards, you know, fast, we've grown, you know, 60% or so a year, every year for 15 years. And so we've been on the Inc. 5000 list for nine straight years. And every year when we hit that report, which they measure your growth over three years, Every time we're on that report, we're between 300% growth and 500% growth. And so if you take any three-year period in the last 15 years, we've grown between 300% and 500%. I have never been and probably will never be in the Inc. 500, meaning one of the 500 fastest growing companies. I've been from 800 to 2,000 every year for nine years. So you know we're not having this unbelievable 2,000% growth in a single year but we are having this consistent growth because we approach our business in a very consistent manner. We set very specific goals to what we're going to accomplish in the next three years. We set even more specific goals. So we, we call it a three-year aim. Then we have a one-year bullseye of specifically what we're going to do this year around strategy, around people, around operations, around acceleration. And then we break that down into what are the actions, what are the things we're going to accomplish in the next 90 days? And what we say at DLP is we accomplish more every 90 days than our competition accomplishes all year. And so we set very specific, we call them rocks, priorities for the next 90 days. And then we break those down into what we call milestones, which are what are we going to accomplish in the next two weeks? And that disciplined approach leads to what most people consider very substantial growth. But, you know, you don't grow 60% a year. You grow a little bit every day or every week. And that compounding effect becomes you know, significant. It happens much faster than you think. And it, it, it still sometimes I sit back and it's amazing. I'm, I'm going into a, what we call a clarity session, which we do every quarter later this afternoon. And I have this whiteboard I found from a clarity session that we did seven years ago that I'm going to bring into the session today with my, my leadership team. And in this meeting we did seven years ago, we wrote out our, our goals you know, it's so funny to look back seven years ago, we set these goals, like an example, a goal was for that whole year was we were going to raise $8 million of capital 
you know, into our investment funds. And that when we, when I rolled that out seven years ago, everybody was like, wow, that is just, how are we going to possibly ever do that? That was just seven years ago. Now that's a decent week for us. It's a pretty good day for us, right? Seven years later, something that seemed unsurmountable to do in a year. Now we do on an average week. So it's amazing, but that, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened through, you know, disciplined approach to building, building our organization and building teams kind of, you know, day over day, week over week. Yeah. The tortoise and the hare kind of <laughs> analogy. So, there. So I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I just want to add one thing really quick there. So, so I always tell people, you know, our key to success has been, we have the very best people and, and it's absolutely the case. We have the best people for our organization. We've built a, a culture and organization. We attract the right people for our organization, which aren't necessarily the right people for somebody else's organization. But then I always tell people we have a secret weapon to our growth. And that secret weapon is what we call the 20 mile march which I didn't develop. I stole from Jim Collins and Jim Collins. He's very famous for a book called good to great, but his better book, in my opinion, is great by choice. And so good to great. He studies and a lot of people have studied him in college and so forth, right? The Southwest airlines versus the Pacific Southwest. And they study these companies that have had this, you know, meteor or growth over 30 years and they compare them to companies who were unsuccessful. Well, in great by choice, he sets out to say, all right, well, what do these great companies, companies that are great for decades, not, not months, not years, but decades, what do they have in common? So if you could emulate it, you would have built a great company. And what he concluded in Great by Choice is that what all of these great companies that he studied over four years had in common is that they all had the 20 mile march mentality. And he tells a great story about you know, two, exp- the two expedition crews that went to go to the South Pole. Nobody had ever been to the South Pole They both set out at the same time, similar teams, similar backgrounds, et cetera. One gets there first, the other gets there 30 days later, and they all die on their way back. And the the moral of the story, the the difference between these two crews is one would march 20 miles every day. The other group would go 40 miles on good days when the weather was good, and then they'd stay in their tent in bad weather. And so they let the outside world dictate what they did. So kind of the business probe, a lot of companies let what's going on in the economy, what's going on with global pandemics, what's going on with their competition, et cetera, to dictate what they, they do every, every day. And great companies, they, they figure out what they do that drives results and they make sure they do that you know, every single day throughout the organization. That level of discipline and focus of what drives results happens throughout the organization. And I tell this story and we play a video for it every single month at our welcome to DLP meeting for all of our new employees. And somebody always says, well, you just said there, it's the tortoise and the hare. When I ask them, explain what this means. And I always tell people it's, that's a great analogy. And in many ways, it's very true, but you know, we give all of our employees, you know, Fitbits. And I explain to anybody who's ever used a Fitbit or a tracking device, right. Is, you know, marching 20 miles is a lot, right. I rarely hit 20 miles in a day. A good day is about 10 miles, right. That's 20 some thousand steps. 20 miles is a lot of activity, right? So I always explain to people, we're not talking about a one mile walk or a three mile stroll. We're talking about a 20 mile march, not at the beginning of the month, not at the end of the month, not at the beginning of the year, not in the summertime, but every single day, day in and day out, that level of discipline throughout the organization where you start getting used to walk marching 20 miles every day. And that level of massive action day in and day out becomes the norm and becomes what's expected. And that level of productivity you know, soars through the roof. So that's a really important, important to mention. And, and I know a lot of people, you know, struggle with, you know, thinking about work-life balance and maybe some, something we'll talk about, but you can march 20 miles, work, be really, really productive day in and day out and build that discipline of doing it while still, you know, living an, an incredible, incredible life. But that level of focus is what's what it takes to, to achieve, you know, long-term growth and success. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you said that because when I, I hesitated about saying the tortoise and the hare, because it sounds, you know, the kind of growth and, and sustainable growth that you're talking about is beyond an ambling along tortoise. <laughs> so I get what you're saying, but that's just a fantastic story, you know, and I, I was really interested in your thoughts on how to sustain this kind of growth. And you answered that before I even asked it. So I love that. And I think that, you know, there's so many good lessons already that you've talked about, you know, the importance of grit and the importance of putting yourself out there and the willingness to put yourself out there and, you know, getting back up every day. You know, when I talk about entrepreneurship, I talk about it as a practice. You're not going to perfect it, but you keep 
at it every day, which is what you're talking about. So kind of with the same kind of devotion and dedication, well, totally, that you would have as an athlete or building any other kind of skill, you know, entrepreneurship is very similar. So I heard you say through this whole thing that you, through our whole conversation, that you read a lot of books and you learn a lot. And so I'm really also interested in that because one of the things that I teach my students about recognizing opportunities is the importance of gathering raw material. So you have to have something to think about, right? And and process. So, so tell us a little bit about your learning style and where that came from. You know, you, you love to read, you said, and you ask a lot of questions. So where did all that come from? And can you talk about that a little? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I didn't, I guess, say, you know, going through school, didn't necessarily love reading, you know, what was presented to us or required to read. And, and but when it, something of interest that, you know, trying to improve upon, I found there's no, you know, better way for me to learn than through books. I just love the idea of being able to say, hey, I really want to, you know, not every book is, is in this kind of vein, but when I say, hey, I want to get better at, at this area to be able to go find people. And having written a book, I know the level of work and effort and research and that goes into somebody writing a book on on a topic, especially a book that becomes, you know, a best-selling book and and well well received. It's a lot that goes into it. So to be able to take somebody having spent hundreds, if not thousands of thousands of hours to put together, not just writing the book, but developing the level of knowledge and, and expertise to be credible to write the book, right? To be able to distill that and get access to that information in five or six or seven hours is, is an amazing, incredible gift. And one I like to take you know, full advantage of. So I read, I don't read physical books often. I'd love to, we all say, and I know a lot of, I don't, not to be discriminatory, but a lot of older people, you know, say, oh, you know, I just can't get the same value if, unless I'm reading the hard book. And we all, not maybe not all, but a lot of us absorb information better when we have the physical book and there's nothing else going on. And that's, that's the preferable method for a lot of us. But what I do is I listen to the book. I've historically used an app called Audible, but Audible actually just recently discontinued their business version. So we're switching to a new upcoming app called Librio, L-I-B-R-I-O, I think it's Librio.fm because we provide this to our organization. So everybody in our company can download unlimited books. We pay for them. If they want to read them and listen to them, we, we believe in them. So, but it's very similar to Audible. And, and so I, you know, put headphones in. So I kind of every opportunity I, I have, you know, so when I'm walking or driving or working out, you know, I put headphones in and, and listen. So, you know, on an average day, I probably get in, you know, an hour of, of listening. And that leads to, I guess a little more than that leads to me, you know, completing, you know, one or two books. Usually I'm reading three or four at a time and completing, you know, one or two every, every week. And I've been doing that for, you know, 10 plus years. And it's been an incredible discipline in our, in our organization. We have a group we started 12 years ago called Driven for Greatness. And Driven for Greatness means, you know, it's one of our core values. It means seeking knowledge. And it's a group where we meet together twice a month, 8 a.m. every other Thursday, and we read a book together. We don't read the book there. We read the book outside of the meeting. And then a different team member, usually a frontline employee, presents on half the book in the meeting. So two different people present their learnings and findings from that book. And we do that every month. So we read you know, 12, 13 books every year together as an organization and, and share our, our learnings and findings, which is you know, a, lot, a lot of fun. So I, I love reading that way. But then I go to a lot of you know, events and and seek people who are very experienced. Every time I go into a new business line or I'm trying to improve in a different area, I try to search out, you know, people who are great in that, whether I already know the person or I go to people I know and ask them, who do they know who's, who's really good at this and ask them. And that's another thing I also do in terms of specifically for people, but I'm always asking every successful person I know, you know, what's your favorite book? You know, what have you read recently? And that's where I find a lot of the books I end up reading is people saying, you know, this is, this is just an incredible book. It's really impactful here. And, and that's how I kind of keep my, my library full of, of new you know, new information to learn. Oh, that's great. And I love that you not only live that philosophy, but you've incorporated it in the culture of your organization. I have a feeling, you know, we don't have time to talk about it all today, but I have a feeling that we're, we're going to have to have you back on so we can dig in more <laughs> to understanding the culture of your organization. Because I have a feeling you, you take a lot of your philosophy and build it into the organization. I did want to ask you about failure because I mentioned earlier about executing past failure. So I'm guessing because I, every successful person I've ever talked to has failed along the way. So I know you probably have a story or two that you could share. Would you be willing to share a story perhaps with us about how you've dealt with failure and, 
and how you view failure and extreme challenges that you faced along the way. And, and what have you learned from that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, first, I guess my, my general philosophy kind of around failure is, is, you know, failure is only failure, you know, if you stop moving forward. And so I really don't dwell on, you know, failures. I'm fortunate and, and, and blessed. And, and much of this is certainly, you know, out of my control. And, and I thank the, thank the Lord. He's blessed me with a lot of, you know, great, great opportunities. And I've never had any, you know, major failure, you know, I haven't had gone bankrupt or we haven't run out of money and not be able to pay payroll or any of those types of, you know, big, huge fundamental kind of restarts I've had to do. So I've been very blessed there, but, but certainly in our process of launching, you know, multiple different business lines and such, not every business line I've ever launched has turned out to be you know, success. And it's often been that, you know, we've started it and, you know, and, and decided it wasn't, you know, a top priority and, or wasn't a top focus. And we've, you know, closed every business. I started a technology company about a dozen years ago and great concept, great product, but never put enough focus and, and discipline towards it that we never got it really to the point that it, it grew into the profitability we look for. And after, you know, three, four years of it, decided to just, you know, wind it down as an example. But, you know, I, I think when you look at failure as an opportunity to learn, you certainly have had failures on, you know, investments, on, on deals, but every time we do take the time to do, you know, an after action review and look, what did we do well? What didn't we do well? What could we have, you know, seen that we didn't see or what we did see, but we ignored? What were the signs? How do, how do we improve? I'd say that I think, I think the biggest day to day or, you know, annual or whatever you want to call it, but a regular kind of failures I deal with and is probably the biggest challenge you're going to face in growing a, a business. From my perspective is all around people. So, you know, a couple of points there. One is, you know, I think one of the things I take the hardest is when I have a team member who somebody we want in the organization and we think is an A player and they leave after you invest a lot of time and energy and effort into somebody for them to leave is a challenging and frustrating can be emotional when you really invest in, in people and very difficult. I think the hardest thing I've had to deal with, and I've heard this from a number of very successful people who built companies much bigger than in mine is understanding that, you know, what the people who got you to where you are may not be able to get you to where you need to go. And sometimes that's a failure on our end that we didn't appropriately develop their leadership ability and their capability fast enough to keep up with the pace of growth in the organization. And if we didn't give them every opportunity to do so, that's, that's on us. But we have had that, that happen a few times now over our growth that people in our top level seats in the organization didn't have the ability to, to lead us to where we were going next. And we've had to, you know, top grade positions and bring leaders above. Sometimes we've been able to repurpose people into a smaller role or sometimes though their egos wouldn't allow that. And I've had to, you know, part ways with some really great people who worked incredibly hard in our early stages of just needing to be a good generalist and needing to be willing to work really hard. Then when the business grew, we needed more specific skills, weren't able to kind of adapt to that environment. Some of that's okay. Some of those people are better suited and their skills are better being in a smaller organization and than that, being the, the top good. grading philosophy by Brad Smart, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's a great, great book on on this challenge, top grading by Brad Smart's concept we've we've implemented throughout the organization. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So I love that you think about failure as a learning experience. And I'm guessing that you approach that in your organization when you have these postmortem meetings to kind of see what worked and didn't work. I remember Liz Smith from, she was at Blooming Brands at the time, would call that they did an autopsy without blame, basically. So, you know, trying to get at what went wrong without pointing fingers and and making people feel personally. And I think think to that point, really quick note, and to give another book recommendation for anybody building an organization, The Oz Principle, which is, in my opinion, the best book on accountability and, and ownership. And I think that's one of the problems in a lot of organizations is, is why people are afraid of failure is because in most organizations, what happens when something doesn't get accomplished is everyone then looks around and say, all right, whose fault was it, right? Mm -hmm. And so people get used to you know figuring out excuses and having scapegoats and you know, wanting to shift and avoid blame. And it often in, in fast growing organizations, the blame tends to be the guy or gal who's no longer here, right? It was all Joe's fault who's no longer here, right? And so, but when you can upfront establish what the goals are, give clear ownership to people to, to achieving those goals, and you establish that upfront, you're going to number one, have less failures and, and achieve more goals when people have clear, clear ownership and understand what, what we're trying to accomplish. But then when people do still fail, you know, having a culture that, that accepts that and says, all right, well, let's, let's learn from it. How do, how do we get better? And people not being afraid of, of admitting that they, you know, they fell down or, or didn't accomplish what they, they set out to do. Yeah, that's all great. You know, I just have to ask you because we've got a lot of students that are really interested in real estate. 
So, you know, in a, I know there's a lot, this could be an entire podcast, <laughs> but what do you see ahead in real estate? Just kind of in the next year or two, just briefly. Yeah. I mean, real estate's, a, you know, my world is mainly around housing. So real estate's a big, big world. There's lots of different types of, of real estate out there. Some that have a rosier outlook than, than other asset classes, but I'll encourage number one that, you know, just because everybody, everybody says it's not a, a good place to invest, for example, retail and office are the places that are often under scrutiny or hospitality, especially through COVID, but that can a lot of times create the best opportunities, right? You're thinking about innovative ideas. I mean, there's going to need, be a need in a lot of places around the country to figure out how to repurpose office space, suburban office space into something else, how to repurpose shopping centers into something else. And it can create lots of opportunities for those who want to look at it from a different lens. Our world revolves around housing, specifically workforce housing, which frankly has never ever, this isn't a good thing for society, but has never ever been in greater demand. And we've never ever had less supply. And you know there were about 7 million housing units short right now, what we need and construction simply is not able and not going to keep up in the foreseeable future. So you know, from an investment standpoint, it creates a lot of safety and a lot of great benefits. But being able to figure out how we how we solve this, how we build more housing, how we do so effectively that people can afford to live where they work and not be cost burdened, where they're spending more than 30% of their income on basic housing needs. It's a major challenge and one we need some great entrepreneurial minds to put some focus around how we do with this. And it's going to likely need to be as much as it's going to be driven by the private sector and entrepreneurial businesses. This challenge is going to need private and public collaboration. And there is some exciting things going on right now and potentially in the current bills to put some funding towards building affordable housing. So so it's an interesting time, but market is, is incredibly hot. And the fundamentals, unlike 2006, 2007, are incredibly strong. In 2006, we had the greatest oversupply of housing in American history. Today, we have the greatest undersupply. So that's a starkly different environment. Doesn't mean there couldn't be volatility like COVID that comes that throws off the market, but fundamentally it's it's a great time to be in real estate for sure. Lots of opportunity I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah. So, well, this has been fantastic, Don. You've already given so many important lessons, I think, about discipline, grit, learning, the whole entrepreneurial mindset. Just, you know, I can understand after spending this time talking to you why you've been so successful at such a young young age, young to me, 36. <laughs> but you were also such a great role model for many of our listeners who are your age and even younger and really interested in taking a similar path. So thank you for sharing your time. If you had one piece of advice and, you know, you've given a ton, but if you had one piece of advice that you could leave with this audience, what would it be? Well, I guess the first thing I would say, I don't know if it's a piece of advice, but I'd say is to ignore the rhetoric and the negativity that's out there we have never, ever been in a greater time to start a business. Never been. If you're listening to this in, in America, you're in the right place. You're in a country that is the land of opportunity. I'm a living example of it and know many are. They're truly, despite all the, the negative things that people talk about, never been a better time to start a business, never been more access to information, to knowledge, to resources. It is just a tremendous, tremendous time. So you're going to face lots of critics when you look to, to start a business, when you look to do something different or new and you know, accept that that's part of the, the journey. As you start having success, you're going to have more critics. And my last, I guess, just note is you can build a great business. And, and I think what's what's exciting today, and you know, I'm a father, we didn't get into kind of this side, but I'm a father of a, a seven and an eight year old. I'm married a 10 years. My wife and actually about to adopt as well. And I can say fully, I mean, I, I work you know really hard. I've worked at points in seasons of my life with four kids, hundred hour plus weeks. I still work 70, 80 hour work weeks, but I live a full life. And, and I call it the eight F's of life, which are faith, family, friends, freedom, fun, fulfillment, fitness, and finance. And you can, in today's world, succeed in all of those areas at the exact same time. It's a good thing to have multiple passions, to have multiple obsessions, and you don't have to sacrifice one or the other. It's not like it was back 30 years ago where to get ahead of your career, you had to stay in the office. You know, the flexibility and freedom we all have today, you can build a great life while building a great career in business. And, and I encourage, last note, to accept that your people, as you grow your organization, do not be afraid to hire people, not think of them as liabilities, but that they're, they're going to be your greatest assets is investing in, in people who are going to be part of your purpose and your mission and with you is an incredible gift and opportunity 
be able to do that. Great advice. And I love that you brought up, I mean, it's it's kind of a new day after COVID. So we didn't get a chance to talk about that. So I'm going to have to have you back. Love to. So we can talk more about, you know, managing remote workforces and how to live those. Did you say eight Fs? I think. Yes. Yes. I'm really excited to hear more about that. So we'll have you back on, Don. Thank you for joining us. Where can our listeners find out more about you, your business, connect with you? Absolutely. So you can go, I mean, you can search me your on book, of Don course. Wenner, W-E-N-N-E-R anywhere, but you can find my book and a lot of free tools and so forth and scaling a business at dlpelite.com. And then our main company website is dlpcapital.com. And you can see a lot of insights about our organization and what we do and a lot of our follow us in, in a number of ways. So but you can find us in you know every every place you find books. And we're launching our podcast in a couple of weeks called Impact, where we get into some of these same topics. Encourage you to, to join there as well. Yes. Don Winter, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about entrepreneurship, we would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of InFactor.